Hi everyone, I'm back with one of my favorite candidates running for Congress. Donna Imam is here running in Texas's 31st Congressional District. I think I got the number right. She advanced to the runoff and she's facing off against the Republican. She might beat him. So Donna, welcome back to the program. Thank you so much, Mike. I really, really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. So glad to be back on your show. It's It's nice to have you. You know, you were kind of like this underdog story that was so fascinating to watch. There were so many candidates running in your race and you're in a position now to make it to Congress. So give us the update because the last time that we talked to you was I think in early March um, and yes. a lot has changed since then. So tell us about what's been going on because um, it, it's hard to follow all of these races, but yours has been so interesting. Yeah, so you know everybody talks about turning Texas blue. So Texas has six congressional districts that have been targeted to flip blue and texas's 31st district is one of them this is the northwest austin suburbs and then it goes north all the way up to killeen which is home to the largest armored vehicle military base in the entire united states so this race started with 12 people in the race six on the ballot but only five running and then in texas if you don't get 50% of the vote, the top two go into our runoff. So we are now heading into our runoff right around the corner. This runoff was supposed to be held on May 26th, but then right after March 3rd, Super Tuesday, after we made the runoff, the pandemic hit. And that's what has shifted this date. Now, just to jog you know, people's memories, this district is two big counties. Williamson County, which is one of the top 10 fastest growing counties in the entire country, and that's by percentage, and Bell County, which is in 2018, Williamson County went blue, but Bell County is where we need to close this just 2.9% gap, handful of votes, 8,000 votes, and we can vote out a nine term Trump endorsed GOP rep who hasn't been here for our district. So that's what this exciting race is all about. No one thought that someone like me without a huge political background, uh, you know, an electrical and computer engineer with an 18 year career would be ever able to make it to a runoff and beat out multiple people who had ran before or were, uh, you know, elected officials. But here we are <laughs> and we are going to this very strong. And the best part about this entire race is this. Remember I told you that Bell County is where the work needs to be done? Well, on March 3rd, our campaign won Bell County. We led there. And the reason we did this is because we did extensive outreach into communities that had never been asked for their vote, never ever. We knocked on their doors, we had a conversation with them, and we told them that you have a choice in representation. And the interesting thing about Bell County is that it is majority Black Americans, Hispanic, Latino and Asian Americans. And many of these people don't vote or don't feel like they have a voice in our political process. They're working class people. There is a huge difference between Williamson County and Bell County. Williamson County is mostly affluent. A lot of tech companies up here, Dell Technologies, Google, Amazon, Apple. But for every single person who has a six figure salary, there are three people that are struggling to make ends meet, struggling to put food on the table. And this is the reason that I am running for Congress because we need to lift up the bottom 50% of our country that is struggling and they need us. And the best part is we can get this done for everybody. So I'm excited, I'm going into this runoff. I think we're in the best position to win. We're the only labor endorsed candidate in this runoff. All the labor unions, both locally, in district, and across the state, statewide, Texas AFL-CIO has endorsed our candidate, our campaign, because we are the campaign for people who work for a living, for working class people. And we believe that at the end of the day, this race is not about Democrats against Democrats. It's not about Democrats against Republicans. It's a fight for our livelihoods. This is about corporations and billionaires who have taken away our individuality, our ability to live freely, and have taken away basic rights like being able to go see a doctor. And even in this pandemic, now we see hundreds of people getting these huge medical bills. Nothing has changed. 
And I know there are many people out there who are very disappointed because they didn't get their presidential nominee. But when all this is over, we still have 80 plus million people who don't have health insurance, who don't, can't go see a doctor. We have our, over 100,000 families that have lo lost a loved one too fast because of coronavirus, because they didn't, weren't able to go to the hospital fast enough, or they didn't have a ventilator, or they had underlying conditions. We see black people dying at almost twice the rate from corona than the population that they represent. And we have to come together and we can solve these problems. That's the best part. That's why I'm running and we want to get it done. I think that what you're doing is basically creating a blueprint for future campaigns because everything that you're doing is exactly what needs to be done. You're reaching out to people who have never been contacted by a political campaign before. And on top of that, I think that COVID-19, it really has changed a lot. I, I know that to one extent, it threw a wrench in you know your plans because as a grassroots candidate, the key to your success oftentimes for a lot of these types of campaigns is knocking on doors, talking to people. So it changed that. But, but at the same time, you know, in this red to blue district, there's this underlying assumption that, you know, you, you can't be too radical. And before this pandemic, I think that it would have been a campaign against you by, you know, conservatives in that district to say, well, she's too radical. She supports something like Medicare for all. But now in a COVID era, you're not the radical. You're actually able to position uh, whoever you're running against as the <laughs> radical if they don't support it. So talk about how COVID-19 has impacted your district and the way that you're able to sell Medicare for all now, as people see firsthand, the necessity of health care. You know, the interesting thing is back in 2019, when I was talking about scaling the healthcare infrastructure, that when we go to single payer, we actually save money. When I talk to whether it's a Republican or an independent or a Democrat that doesn't uh, uh, you know, support Medicare for all, it's primarily because they don't understand what Medicare for all is. So, so this is the argument that I give. And by, by the way, this works every single time. If you're trying to convince anybody of Medicare for all, use this. In 2018, we paid $3.68 trillion for health care, but that still left out over 80 million people from being able to actually see a doctor. It didn't matter whether you have insurance or you don't have insurance, you could not see somebody when you were sick. However, every single study, including conservative think tank studies, say that if we go to single payer health care for all, Medicare for all, it should cost somewhere between two and three trillion dollars. Well, guess what? Two and three trillion dollars is a lot less than three point six eight trillion dollars. And every time I give this argument, people are like, wow, that makes real sense. I think I can get on board with that. That's number one. Number two, I explain to them that Medicare for all keeps every single provider private. And it is very different from the system in the UK. And it is also different from the system in Canada, by the way. Canada does not have what Medicare for All does. It separates it into, the, into their various provinces. Medicare for All takes it and says, you can go see any doctor, any nurse that you want to when you need to. And it is cheaper because it's pooled because there's only one pair and you're taking out the billions of dollars in profit that health insurance companies are, are making in the middle that impact nothing. It doesn't impact the care of you, the, the quality of your care. It doesn't impact the fact of your health. It doesn't do anything. It's just sitting there as fat. And we need to cut this fat out if we're going to survive. So that's how we're still talking to people. Now, the interesting thing is, in March, after the pandemic hit, every article in the Washington Post and New York Times article was talking about scaling the healthcare infrastructure because they were putting up these tents in Central Park to put, you know, because they didn't have enough hospital beds. And in 2019, we were talking about scaling the healthcare infrastructure and people were like, Donna, what do you mean by that? And what I meant is very simple, that our country has a lack of primary care physicians and nurses at the primary care level. And if we practice preventative healthcare, the cost of healthcare will go down even more than $2 trillion because you will attack these underlying causes and people will get sick less. People will not end up in the hospital. We will not use ER as our first line of defense. And it also would mean more things like more ventilators. 
things like, you know, when the first time the masks came out and they were like, many of these masks have mold in it, that nobody was actually looking at our uh, supply chain of medical supplies for PPE and doing first in, first out, for example. These are, this is what I mean when I talk about scaling the healthcare infrastructure. So we try to talk about solutions in terms of, in terms that people understand. And when you take away these labels, all of a sudden people are receptive because the minute you put labels on your solution, they, it becomes like a sports game, right? Oh, I'm for this, this team and you're for that team. But when you start talking about, look, do you want the kid that is going to school with your kid getting sick and dying from COVID because their parent d doesn't have health insurance coverage? Do you want your neighbor, do you want the person who cleans your house to die from coronavirus? And people will say, no, well, I don't want that. And that's why we need health care for every single person, because that is who we are as human beings. And that is the American way. And I want every single person to know we can do this for a lot less money. And this is great long term, whether you have great health insurance or not. And I'll tell you that in Williamson County, remember, I just told you that we have all these tech companies, these software developers and business people make six figure salaries. And if you go talk to them, they'll tell you. I'm not happy with my private health insurance and they have health insurance and every single person has gone through a layoff in their life these days. They understand what it's like to be in between and not be able to cover their children. So these are solutions that relate to every single person. We have to stop dividing us up into pieces and reaching out because these things impact middle class people. They even impact some upper middle class people as well. Remember, middle class people, upper middle class people, they don't get any assistance for their kids when they go to college. Zero dollars of assistance. They know how hard it is to send two kids to college. It's like two mortgages. So they are on board. And when you talk to them in these terms, they're like, I want to vote for your campaign. You make sense to me. And that's how we're winning people over in our district. And that makes sense because when you sanitize, you know, the issues that we're talking about or you kind of depolitify them in the sense that you talk about it on a real concrete human level, people are receptive to that because I think that people are primed or at least conditioned to think about political issues in partisan terms. But these aren't necessarily partisan issues. I mean, political parties make them into partisan issues, but these are issues that affect everyone. And, you know, in this COVID era, you know, like pre-COVID era, I felt like it was really easy to make the case for Medicare for All and sell it. Now, COVID makes that case for us, you know, and at a time when so many people are losing their jobs, as you noted, and they're losing their private insurance as a result, um, you can't make the case that, well, you know, w what do we do with all these people who love their private insurance? One, that's not actually two. And true, people are losing their private insurance. So it it's really important that now more than ever, we push hard for Medicare for all and to make sure that everyone has health care because, you know, with the end of the Democratic primary, the national election, it, it seemed like it was a lost cause. Like I felt really defeated um, because, <laughs> you know, if we don't have a president who would sign it into yeah. law, then, you know, is there any hope? But I think that there is hope because this is something that it can happen, but it has to be from the bottom up and not the top down. I think that's one thing that's clear. I wanted to ask you about the representative currently. He's a nine time incumbent, mm -hmm. nine term incumbent, uh, John Carter. How has his response been to the district with regard to COVID-19? Because I think that now is the time more than ever for leadership to make sure that people in Congress are caring to the very specific concerns of each unique district. How would you grade him? Well, my experience has, has been um, very dismal of his of what he's been doing. And I'll, and I'll give you specific examples. So when, um, first of all, Corona hit and everything was shut down, as you know, Texas lost over 2 million jobs. So one of the first questions that people had was, how do I get my stimulus check? When the stimulus check, check actually came about, you know, in late March and people were talking about it. That was the first question. The second thing that a lot of people may be aware of is that 
there are more veterans in my district per square mile than anywhere else in the entire state of Texas. So there are a lot of veterans who actually don't file taxes. And one of the requirements was that you had to file either 2018 or 2019 taxes. And people on really low on income that were getting SSI, or if you were uh, a veteran, sometimes you didn't even file taxes. So one of the biggest issues people were reaching out to us was, how do I get my stimulus check? And think about it, as a representative, that should have been the first thing that he should have communicated either via email or letter or some public way that every single person would know. They didn't. Our campaign got in touch with people and helped them maneuver the IRS website to figure out how to get their stimulus check, number one. Number two, simple things like if you type in your address in capital letters, you can actually find out whether you're going to get a check or not. And then we informed them that they didn't need to file a tax, for example, if they weren't required to file taxes, they would get their stimulus checks anyway. But there are still people to this day that didn't get their stimulus checks and don't know how to get it and have no clue and we still try to work through them. And the way we did this is two ways. One, we did it digitally through various Zoom calls, town halls. And second, we did it through a, a, a 30 minute radio segment specifically targeted in areas that we know have people that are worried about their stimulus check. So areas that their income is under $75,000 and they've lost their jobs, we did some programs to make sure that they would know that. So that was one. Number two, I personally picked up the phone and called lots of mom and shop small businesses. And to my dismay, what I found is that most of them, almost all of them, had no idea that there was any assistance available. That was the saddest part. Many of these small businesses, especially ethnic restaurants, are run by people of color. And they are both the owner of the restaurant, they also cook in the restaurant, they serve in the restaurant, and they were really struggling to pay their bills because people weren't going out to restaurants anymore. And when I picked up the phone and said, hey, do you know that you have, you know, this ability to get some assistance to pay people to keep them on payroll. They were like, we didn't even know that was available. Where do we get it, Donna? So we tried to direct them to resources, but unfortunately, many of these small businesses, when they reached out to the banks, they were told that the money had completely dried up and it was completely gone. So I would say based on our interaction with the community, that the representatives, the current representatives you know, performance has been dismal to none. It's been very disappointing because we, remember, we wrote a 6,000 plus, I think it was $6,000 plus check on every man, woman, and child in this country. They have taken out a loan on your children to pay this. And most of this money went to major corporation over, you know, 600, $700 billion. And even the small business amounts, they went to chain restaurants across the entire country. They went to paying, we heard of, you know, people paying off their royalty fees for McDonald's chains, for example, people who didn't need that money, but actual mom and pop shops, they lost out and they're still struggling. And today we still have millions of people in this country with completely no way to go back to work. By the way, right now, the cases in Texas have been spiking day after day after day, both hospitalizations and the number of cases. We have no plan in pace, place for contact tracing. And because we are one of the countries that handle testing so poorly from the very beginning that we are not prepared for opening up in a safe way. And we talk about our Congress and our leadership, right? Yet they know these things. It's not like the United States doesn't have the smartest people in the world. We do. We have the smartest scientists in the world. We have the smartest engineers in the world. But nobody's taking the initiative to say, you people in Congress, do you understand that 120,000 families had to bury somebody over the last eight to 10 weeks in this country? Do you know how painful it is to put your grandmother away early, 10 years early, because she had an underlying condition and couldn't survive COVID. And how many families are going through this? This didn't have to happen in our country. 
Yeah, and as you as you explain the failure there, it's definitely a failure in leadership. But I also get a sense that there's just ambivalence there because I mean, if you are up for re-election, then you want to brag to your constituents about what you helped to accomplish. So if he voted for the CARES Act, assuming he did, then you'd want to let them know that they have access to these benefits. You'd want to assist them in getting their stimulus check. But to not even do that, I mean, you're not doing the bare minimum at that point. And I wanted to ask you, because there's a lot going on in this country with regard to reopening. Uh, you see a number of states reopening, and it seems as if they're very clearly reopening too soon. In my state, for example, in Oregon, we're reopening as cases spike. Now, I think that the governor, Kate Brown, has handled it adequately up until this point, but you don't reopen as cases are going up. So, you know, what do we need? I, I think that there's this sense that we have to reopen as quickly as possible. And I get that because economically, people are suffering. You know, this is going to cause yeah. them real pain economically, putting aside like, you know, the health risk. But if you were in Congress, what would you do? What would be, you know, the thing that you'd fight for? I know this is a very loaded question, but how do we yes. reopen? And there's no perfect answer, but how do we reopen in a way to where we can kind of balance, you know, the economic risk but also make sure that we're protecting people and we're not putting people at risk. What would you do in, you know, as a legislator, as a lawmaker? So this is a really great question because I was asked this very early on in March, what we should do. And what we should have done is we should have gone on a full three to four week shutdown. So imagine if you've taken the $6,000 on every single man, woman and child and just given them the $6,000. With $6,000, you could easily get through an entire month with a full shutdown. And if we had done a proper full, full, full shutdown, including very minimal grocery store openings, meaning that you couldn't go into a grocery store, you had to pick up your basic groceries from you know, the front of the door, and you were limited to basic items, let's say, right? And if we, all of us came together and we went on a true shutdown for four weeks, we couldn't have we could have beaten this faster so that would have been number one that i would have fought for number two there are three things that we could have done to extremely cut down coronavirus very fast one is all wear masks all the time everywhere and if we did this for a even a small period of time and wearing masks is uncomfortable i get it and i understand that this is a freedom and liberty because i believe in having freedom and liberty. But if we all did it, we could have gotten over this much faster. If we all did it together for four weeks together, guess what? We This would be down to nothing. So that's number two. Number three, if we had scaled up our testing to a point that if you absolutely had to work, if you had to be in a grocery store and you had to stock the shelves, that you were tested multiple times, that you had all the PPE that you needed, that would have worked. And then the last but not the least is contact tracing. If we had put in proper contact tracing, which is what they did in South Korea and some other countries, and they're doing it effectively, if we had done these four things together, given people the resources to survive for four weeks, wearing masks, if you have to absolutely you know, interact with other people, contact tracing and extensive testing, and we'd all come together to do it for four weeks, guess what? we would be able to open up safely, cases would be down, and we would be back and our economy would be back much, much, much faster. So that's what I would have advocated for. And I would have done a no means test way of getting these funds to every single American. And for those of you out there who you know, bring up this argument, okay, if you're a billionaire, you don't need $6,000. The government could have just given this money and then a year later, two years later, on your taxes, if you were a billionaire, you could give back your $6,000, right? But the interesting thing is we could have done it much faster if we just gave everybody the resources they needed, come together, and got it done. And this is something that we as Americans should have done. We're the most technolo technologically advanced country in the entire world. We have some of the smartest brains in this country. I can't believe that we didn't come together and solve this faster and show how it was done when countries like New Zealand were able to do it. And people complain, oh, well, New Zealand only has, you know, 5 million people. But take the United States and let's divide it up into 5 million sections. We could have done this, guys. Yeah. And everything you say is exactly what I said in a conversation I had about COVID a couple of days ago, that if we all just kind of like hunkered down for a good few weeks, maybe a month, 
this would be over. We wouldn't be having this conversation. And it really seemed like I'm disappointed because at first it seemed like everyone was on board. This wasn't necessarily a partisan issue. But as time goes on, as people mm -hmm. get more desperate and frustrated, now we start to see the partisanization of COVID-19, which is what we kind of touched on earlier. You know, we, we see masks becoming less of a health issue and more of a political statement for some reason. And, you know, our government is just fully incapable of dealing with this. I mean, you bring up such a great point about the means testing thing. We don't want to means test everything to death because we want people to be able to access these things fast and quickly. We don't want people to know whether or not they will get it. We want everyone to know that, they, that they'll get it. And, you know, it, it, the delivery of the stimulus has been a disaster. I actually didn't get mm -hmm. mine until like mid-May. Um, had no idea how to get access to it. I didn't have help from my representative as well. So it, it's complicated and it doesn't have to be. I think we're, you know, government is overcomplicating it. And there's, you know, the combination of that along with the frustration from people. And like you said, it's it's not that difficult. You know, this is a pandemic. It's something that those of us alive today haven't experienced unless you were alive during the Spanish flu. You know, you'd be over 100. <laughs> but, you know, it's something new. But at the same time, you know, People, epidemiologists have studied this. There have been, you know, responses that they've crafted to this. So it's not like we weren't prepared, but still we weren't prepared. You know, it's like there's I, I just find a difficult time coming up with excuses. So to hear you say that in such, you know, a common sense way to lay out how easy it is, it's refreshing to see, which is why we have to elect you into Congress. Uh, so moving <laughs> on to a different issue. I wanted to ask you about the Black Lives Matter protests, because if you're elected, you will be representing a district with a large population of people of color. Yep. So what would be your response? Because there, there's so many things that we have to do to dismantle institutional racism and stop police brutality. If you're in Congress, what do you fight for specifically? How do you make it so this is no longer an issue? That's a great question, Mike, and you're absolutely right. So Bell County is over 25% black Americans. So in 2019, you know, early 2019, I quit my job to do this. And one of the things I did is I spent a good six months researching this district, going precinct to precinct, meeting with people, trying to understand what their challenges are. And one of the big things that was brought to my attention was the justice system and the failures of our justice system. So we crafted what's called Equal Justice for All, and it's on my website. It's a two page white paper where we put forth ideas on how to solve the challenges in our justice system. This was way before George Floyd and Derek Chauvin and all the stuff that we saw on video before. Now, in 2019, if you went to our website, you would see facts. The first fact is that black men, unarmed black men are being killed to death at twice the rate of the population they represent. You cannot ignore race as a factor. Race must be a factor in the solution. And we put forth many different solutions on how to handle this. For every single George Floyd video, there are hundreds of videos that do not exist, that have not been documented. But the numbers of deaths of black people that are unnecessarily harassed not, is not just limited to law enforcement. There are hundreds of stories, one came up right after George Floyd, where a 68-year-old black woman was attacked and assaulted by police officers because of future theft. She and her son had already purchased a television. They were taking it out of Sam's Club when they were, you know, stopped. Police were called in and an altercation happened. It was all caught on video. Black people have been facing this humiliation for not just decades, but centuries. And we have to address it head, head on. So our solution to this is equal justice for all. We believe that we have to absolutely look at what is going on in our law enforcement system. And I'll discuss just a couple of things here. One is police officers right now can have many, many complaints. By the way, in the case of George Floyd, multiple police officers has complaints against them, but they're still serving. And the reason they're able to do that is that there's zero accountability. And even if you get fired from your police department, you can go 10, 20 miles away to the next city and get rehired. So one of the solutions that we were proposing is that police must carry liability insurance and this liability insurance would be purchased 
for them by the city. Because guess what? Every time a police officer screws up, guess who pays the bill when, when the city gets sued? We do. We pay those millions of dollars, not that guy. And he can go to the next city, the next state. He can move to Alaska and go be a cop all over again. So bottom line is that's one of the solutions that we're, that we're proposing. So if you go to the next city, now they're going to have to buy liability insurance for you and they're not going to be able to purchase it at an acceptable rate. They're going to look into your background and you're not going to be hireable. So we have to hold them accountable. Number two, this is very important. Our military has stricter rules of engagement in war zones than our policemen do in our residential neighborhoods. And that's just got to stop. There is absolutely no justification for tear gas against peaceful protesters. There's no justification for rubber bullets and charging, using a police vehicle to charge into peacefully protesting people. And we saw video after video after video over the last four weeks of that. That has got to stop, period. And we have to stop buying these assault style, you know, police officering and funding this type of police officering. It doesn't make any sense at all. It's illogical. It's got to change. I have a whole two page paper on how to how to change it. But we have to address the fact that this is a race based issue. Race has to be part of the solution. But we can solve this. We can solve this. And now the thing is this. Protests have gone across all 50 states. It is time for action. We shouldn't wait a single second. We must take action on the way police officers treat peaceful protesters. Everyone has a right to peacefully protest. And by the way, the fact that we are able to do that is the envy of the entire world. You take this away from us, you take away the American in us. We have to be able to get out on the streets and peacefully protest, and we can get this done. Yeah, I'm glad that you said that because what you're saying is common sense. And I think that people know that it's common sense. They agree with you. I think that a lot of people just weren't aware of these things. And we're kind of seeing this type of cultural shift as people wake up to what's been going on. And I wanted to ask you about another thing because, you know, handling specific policing issues, that really is a state and local issue. But as a member of Congress, would you be able to facilitate, you know, reappropriating fr funds away from police departments and into social services? So, for, for example, you know, we've been talking on the program about how we kind of take any issue, no matter what it is, and we throw police at it. You know, instead of addressing homelessness with housing, we police the homeless, you know, and we make, you know, uh, being homeless a crime in essence. So how at the federal level would you, you know, stipulate these types of changes if states are unwilling to act? Is there legislation that could actually be conducive to change and really, you know, reappropriating these funds away from, you know, the police whose budgets are just bloated in cities across the country and into different services? How would you make that happen at, you know, the, the governmental level nationally? Absolutely. My entire campaign rebuilds this basic right of Americans, which is health care education, high wage jobs. Let's be real. Every single dollar of wealth in our country is created by people who work for a living. It is not created by billionaires. Jobs are not created by billionaires. It is not created by corporations. Sure, someone might come up with an idea, but if you don't execute on that idea, you don't make wealth. That wealth is created by Americans. And the best way to do this is very simple. We have to stop making policing about, you know, going after something like a problem has already happened. It has to be proactive. Policing should be about de-escalating. It should lead with de-escalating, number one. Number two, think about it this way. If you're a kid who grew up in a single parent home and you don't have role models, you don't have food. When you come home from school, you don't have food. You can't do your homework. You don't have internet access. You can't, there is not a snack for you in the refrigerator. And your mom works three jobs because, and that's why she's not at home when you get home from school. What are you going to do? You're going to get into trouble. You're going to not have the resources that you need to be successful. 
We need to make sure that people who work for a living are not working 60, 70 hours and still not being able to pay their rent. That doesn't make sense. This is why I am focused on real pay for all, that if you work full time and you're a single mom and you're working 40 hours, you should be able to live where you work, pay for all your essentials and be able to save to put a down payment on the American dream and be able to retire someday. We have to give every American that assurance. And by the way, if anybody tells you that that is not possible, they are wrong. We create more than enough wealth for every single American in this country to live comfortably. We're not asking for 10 homes in 10 different states. We're asking for a safe place to raise our children and we can get it done. My entire campaign is focused on healthcare, debt-free education for every single person, whether it's trade school, college, whatever you want, and high wage jobs, and we can get there I have the financial and the economic solution underlying it. We can talk about it in specifics and it will not raise your taxes. I guarantee you, if there's one thing I'm good at, that's math as an engineer. And I'm telling you that we can afford this. We can afford this for every single American and it will not increase our taxes. And we have to take this message to Republicans. We have to take this message to the average American that is working that is watching corporate owned media because remember corporate owned media is owned by the billionaires and the corporations they're always going to want the status quo we can't give up give up because we didn't get our presidential candidate legislation is done in congress and i'm still here i'm still fighting our campaign is still fighting we have scores of volunteers still fighting why because they believe in this country. They're working, they want to put the right people in Congress, and we can do this, guys. Don't give up. We're going to get health care for everybody in this country. Trust me, we're going to get debt-free education, and we're going to get high-wage jobs, and we're here working to get it done. So don't lose hope, because we will get this done, because we are Americans, and we can do anything. Yeah, and that's really important that you say that because I think a lot of people have this instinct to want to check out, but then that's not necessarily an option because all of these issues don't just go away if we lose, you know, an election. It doesn't just all of a sudden, you know, you know, not become an issue. So we, we have to keep fighting. It it's not an option, basically. Um, and so I like that you like with everything that you talk about, every issue that you examine you attack the root cause. And I think that there aren't enough people in Congress that do that. Like, there's not enough wonkish people, even if they like to pretend to be wonks. I mean, people tend to just simplistically look at an issue and say crime. That just means we need more police. When in actuality, you have to examine the root causes. Look at the socioeconomic factors that lead to crime. I mean, this is, it's complicated, but, but at the same time, it's not new. Like we figured these things out decades ago. It's just a matter of applying the appropriate solutions. So I think that if you were in Congress, I mean, it, it would be a game changer. So anyone who's watching, I know my audience already is sold on you. What can we do to help you win? Yeah, so uh, early voting here starts on June 29th, and you guys probably will see this a day before or so. We are a completely grassroots campaign. We've gotten this far because of generous donations from people like you. And by the way, people who watch the Humanist Report gave us small donations, hundreds of them. We're here only because of you. And we're if we make it to Congress, it'll be because of you and our volunteers and people who have put their effort in. And right now, because of coronavirus, we can't go door to door. That was our edge in the primary. So we need help phone banking. We have 71,000 Democrats that voted in the primary. A bunch of them voted for our campaign. We need to remind them that you got to come out and vote because if you don't vote for the right Democrat, we're going to have the straightest, we're going to have the same status quo. It is important that we put the people that are fighting for the things we believe in. And even if you believe you're alone in this country, you are not. There are Republicans, there are independents, there are Democrats, there are people who have no labels, Green Party, that believe in the same things we do. When you break it down to them, we are all together in this. So we need your help, phone banking. We would love any donations. We will, this is, my, our campaign is one of the highest ROI campaigns that is available. So most campaigns spend somewhere between 14 to $15 to reach each voter. We are able to reach each voter with $1. 
So if we can raise $70,000, we can reach 70,000 voters. So that's how effective we are in reaching voters. Um, we use every dollar for direct voter contact and we maximize it because of our volunteers and the way we have adjusted to coronavirus and the way we're interacting with them. So we try to talk to them on the phone, we try to get literature to their door and then have a conversation and we would love any help you can give us. Um, that's what we need to win. We just need to get our message to the voter. And by the way, another piece of hope I'll give you is every time we get our message to our voter, we win. We win every single time. It doesn't matter who we're up against, Democrat, Republican. When they see our message, they're like, makes total sense, Donna. I'm voting for Donna Hyman. So trust us, we can get this done. Yeah, I'm glad that you said that because it kind of confirms that I've been right all along about this, not to toot my own horn. But like, I think that a lot of these races with so many dynamic campaigns, it just is a matter of people knowing who they are, knowing that they have this option because people default to the incumbent if they don't know right. that they have the option. But if they know they have the option, that progressive is going to win. And so this race is so fascinating. Um, I don't think people <laughs> realize what's coming. Like, this is a really uh, interesting race and you could just crush it and make it into Congress. Like, I don't think the establishment even knows what's happening. So uh, Donna Imam, Texas 31st District, uh, early voting starts June 29th. Uh, let's make this happen because I'm all in and I know that the audience is too. Thanks, Donna, for coming on the program. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. And the website is votefordonna.com.